I won a book. When's the last time you won anything? I can't remember when I last won anything, except for this book. It's called Own It. How our generation can invest our way to a better future. And I won it thanks to a competition run by the lovely Martha at Squanderlust Podcast. If you haven't experienced the Squanderlust Podcast before, then I recommend you check that out. I'd like to read one of the chapters for you. It's called Should You Save or Invest for Your First Home? Now, obviously, I'm taking the chapter completely out of context. This is chapter six. I don't know quite what stage you're at. One of my blogs is mainly aimed at students. By all means, let me know if that's not you. And if you think I should have included a bit more of the before and after before launching into this chapter. But I'm just going to read straight from the book because it's only a couple of pages. And I think the author, Iona, Iona Bain, I hope I'm not butchering her first name. Iona? Iona? Ion? Io? 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 Iona? An apology because I'm sure it's not that difficult to pronounce her name and that I'm just overthinking it. But I'm just going to read chapter six. It's only a couple of pages so that you can see if this is a book for you, potentially. It's available from Harriman House, who also published the book Inspirational Investing that I featured in a previous in instalment. So I will leave links to that as well. In years gone by, there was only one recommended route for wannabe buyers. That was to stick to saving. No ifs, no buts. That's because it's widely assumed that most first-time buyers are aiming and able to get those keys within five years. This surely rules out for investing for your first home, right? As we saw in chapter three, which I'm not reading today, but I promise you chapter three does exist in the book. Investing is only suitable for goals that are more than five years away. Well, not necessarily. High rents and subdued wage growth have meant that many young people have needed to save for much longer than five years to get on the property ladder. Just as an aside, I totally agree with that. It definitely took me more than five years to save my deposit. In fact, that waiting game has typically been 10 years across the UK, rising to 15 years in London, according to research from Hamptons International. And something else has changed the rules of the game too. It's called the Lifetime ISA, LISA. And this is also something mentioned earlier in the book as one of the exceptions to the barren savings rule right now. First, let's get to know the ISA family. ISA is an acronym standing for Individual Savings Account. It's a legal structure that was launched by the government in 1999 and it allows anyone to save into it up to a certain amount and hold any interest or investment returns that make within it tax free. Everyone gets an ISA allowance each tax year, which begins on the 6th of April. And right now is 20,000 pounds a year, though this can change. You can put your allowance into one or a combination of ISAs. There are currently four available for those aged 18 and over. One is close to new customers, help to buy ISAs. Another can only be open for someone under 18, junior ISAs. And remember that the ISA itself is not a product, but a tax-free wrapper for your cash or investments. We'll get to know the other three key members of the ISA family later. Let's concentrate on the latest edition, the Lifetime ISA. Launched in 2017 by the government, it can only be opened by someone aged 18 to 40, and it can be used either for your retirement savings or to buy your first home. And for now, we'll focus on the latter. The LISA is the first vehicle that provides a real incentive for young people to invest for their first home. That's because there are two different versions of the LISA, and both come with a bonus from the government. You can either put your LISA into cash or you can put it into investments through what is commonly described as a stocks and shares LISA. Every one pound you put into the LISA will be topped up by 25p by the government. The maximum you can save into a LISA annually is 4,000 pounds. So that means you could get up to 1,000 pounds free cash towards your first home every year. If you save the full whack, allowed from the minimum age of 18 to the maximum age of 40, you could get 32,000 pounds free from the government. Blimey, as the author says, the cash version of the LISA offers interest in addition to the government bonus, which varies depending on the provider you choose. The rates haven't been stellar. The best the author has seen so far is 1.5%, but the government bonus is effectively a 25% interest rate anyway, making the cash LISA the most lucrative savings vehicle out there by a long way. The stocks and shares LISA is potentially on another level. As seen in chapter three, equities do tend to outperform savings over longer periods. So the possibility of much better returns may well tempt you to invest for your first home. But the author is about to slap some huge health warnings on this strategy. Firstly, remember that the past really is no indicator of the future. Yes, research shows that investing in shares outperform cash in most five and 10 year periods historically. But will this happen again in the future? Secondly, the performance of your stocks and shares slicer will depend on where and how it is invested. There isn't one single investment you can buy that will magically do the job. In part two of the book, she goes into detail about how a portfolio can reduce the risks involved without ever being able to remove the risk 100%. I also talked about modern portfolio theory. 
thanks to Mama Furfa in that instalment, so I can link to that also. And that's all about portfolios and diversification also. What happens if that stock market roller coaster plummets and shows no sign of rising again for a good while? Uh-oh. You might have to wait months or even years for your investments to regain their value. That's the last thing you want when you've had your fill of renting or you found the right place at the right price and you need to pony up the cash for your deposit straight away. Young people who were on the cusp of converting their stocks and shares LISA into a first home deposit early in 2020 had to think again when stock markets crashed due to COVID-19. So that presents a conundrum. Should you open a stocks and shares LISA to invest for your first home? And here are the main questions you need to ask for yourself. So number one of the key LISA questions, are you sure you want to buy? The LISA is by far your best bet if you're 100% certain you want to buy property. But if you change your mind, you'll pay a 25% penalty on any withdrawals from the LISA, which claws back the government bonus and takes some of your money in the process too. Note that this 25% penalty was temporarily cut to 20% following COVID-19. Many people were unable to access universal credit, the main benefit offered by the government, because their LISA savings counted against them. This penalty cut is still in place at time of writing, with pressure from many advocates, including the author, to maintain it after the crisis passes. But the current plan is to reinstate the 25% penalty at a later stage. In the meantime, I recommend that you only take out a LISA if you can commit to it. Otherwise, you need to find other savings accounts that will pay an above average rate of interest. Question number two of the key LISA questions. Are you confident that you will buy within five years? If so, the author says there's no point thinking about investing. Stick to your cash LISA. Head to the comments if you disagree. Key LISA question number three. How comfortable do you feel risking your home deposit? This is a toughie. Yes, a stocks and shares LISA can and should be invested in a way that will reduce your risks, which is particularly important when you're relying on this money to fund your first home. But ultimately, if you can't stomach the idea of your money being at any kind of risk whatsoever, it's best to play it safe. When people are new to investing, they often overestimate how much risk they're willing to entertain because it's tricky for them to accurately predict how they will react if markets fall. Of course, you can get a lot more comfortable with risk when you learn more about investing. But if you think there's any chance that a fall in your investments would freak you out and possibly provoke you to withdraw your money, it's vital that you listen to that instinct and go with a cash lyser. Nobody knows your mind better than you. Don't hang your hopes on housing. The author's final word on the whole housing shebang before we move on, and 10 out of 10 for using the word shebang because I thought I might be the only person. Other favourite words include shindigs and hootenannies. I should really find more cause to fit the words shindig or hootenanny into a sentence. If you're still renting, please do read the rest of the book. It's just as much for renters as anyone because all young people need to get to grips with long-term saving and investing, regardless of their housing status. Buying a home isn't compulsory and neither is investing towards a home deposit. It's totally fine to choose to save for your first home in a cash LISA or even in a regular savings account if you're not sure. In fact, it might be the best thing to do if you're looking to buy within five or 10 years and you really don't feel comfortable taking that extra risk. Most crucially, you shouldn't put all your faith in housing. Yes, it's lovely to have a place you can call your own, but don't get too comfortable in your new crib. Your financial journey is far from over. If you can achieve your home buying dream, you have a fantastic opportunity to open new financial horizons. The temptation might be to sit back, hope that house prices will grow and rely on selling your property one day for big bucks, perhaps to fund your eventual retirement. After all, that seems to be what a lot of boomers are doing or at least claiming to do. But that would be a big mistake. Personal and professional reasons, personal and professional reasons, gosh, I can't say reasons today should be behind your home buying zeal as much as financial ones. Besides, property should only be one part of the plan to build your long-term wealth. And when it comes to your later life, there is one product the author touched on earlier that she blows wide open in the next chapter, and that's the pension. Not least because you're probably already saving into a pension, if you didn't know already. And off she goes to explain why pensions are sexy, which I'm not going to read right now. Just in case I make you break out into a sweat, that would be awkward. Let me know what you think. As I mentioned, the same publisher has a free book on investing too, called Inspirational Investing. The print copy isn't free, but the ebook is free to download. I don't know how long for. And as I said, I'll leave links to all the other installments related below as well.